So is it possible for an object moving with a constant speed to experience an acceleration? The answer is a definitive yes. We know that acceleration occurs anytime the velocity changes. So even if the magnitude of the velocity, that is the speed does not change, so long as the direction of motion changes, the velocity changes and acceleration results. So uh, today, we are going to start by taking a look at the kinematics of a special type of circular motion, what we call uniform circular motion, or UCM for short. This is the case where objects move in circles at a constant speed. We will then generalize our discussion of circular motion to include the case where objects don't move at a constant speed, but rather a changing speed, while still moving in a circular path. After we talk about Newton's laws of motion, we'll return to the topic of circular motion and look at the dynamics of circular motion. That is, we will attempt to explain why objects move in circles. Or said another way, okay, what are the physical requirements to get objects to move in circular paths? So let's start our discussion of the kinematics of uniform circular motion by defining exactly what we mean by uniform circular motion or UCM. Now, in the past, in our discussion of kinematics, we talked about uniform motion. That is motion where the speed of the object is constant. Okay, motion at a constant speed. So it really should be no stretch of the imagination that if we add the word circular into this uh, expression here, when we talk about uniform circular motion, we're simply talking about motion in a circle at a constant speed. See how easy this is? Let's take a look at some examples of objects that exhibit, or at least nearly exhibit, uniform circular motion. Starting with the hands of a clock. You see here how these hands of a clock, any given hand, moves at relative, relatively constant speed in a circle. My, my, how time flies in a physics class. What about the flywheel in the internal combustion engine of a car? The internal combustion engine transforms the vibrational or back and forth motion of the pistons into nearly uniform circular motion of the flywheel. What about the gears in your transmission that physically link to the flywheel? Ah, uh, and lucky for you, okay, in this last example here, when we talk about an LP, okay, many of you are going to get a history lesson today. This is how we used to get our music in the olden days when I was a kid. When you look at the LP or this disc, okay, what was called a record, um, as that turntable turns, okay, about 33 revolutions per minute, it is an example of an object that exhibits nearly uniform circular motion. Let's see what our friendly one-year rabbit Bongo has to say here. Ah, this sounds like something to look forward to in, in an upcoming slide. So as we said in our opening slide, if an object moves in a circle, okay, it accelerates. We're starting off by looking at the special case where the object moves at a constant speed in a circle. And as we will see, we will call this acceleration, we'll name it or call it a centripetal acceleration. We're gonna look at deriving this uh, using a non-calculus approach, an approach that um, is actually going to give us a better feel for how this acceleration originates. So let's start by talking about the definition of acceleration. 
okay, something we're very familiar with. Now, we say that the average acceleration is simply the change in velocity divided by the change of time, and that the instantaneous acceleration is simply the limit of the average acceleration as you let that time interval get infinitesimally small, so that your interval of time really becomes a single point in time. But what you should notice here is that this tells you that you get an acceleration any time that the velocity changes for whatever reason. So um, here we're starting with our definition of acceleration. And when we look at the cause of the acceleration for the special class of motion we call uniform circular motion, okay, we see that even though the magnitude of the velocity does not change, okay, the magnitude of the velocity is constant in time, we have a constant speed, because the direction of the velocity continuously changes, okay, this directional change causes the acceleration. Now, we will see later on that you can have the velocity change for two reasons because its direction changes and because its magnitude changes. That is gonna be the more general case of circular motion that we'll consider at the end of this presentation. But for now, when we talk about the centripetal acceleration, we're talking about the acceleration that results strictly because the direction of the velocity changes, okay, um, as opposed to the magnitude, okay, or the speed changing. So let's start to derive this expression for the acceleration of an object that is exhibiting uniform circular motion. Now we know that acceleration is a vector, okay? That means that it has a magnitude as well as a direction. We're gonna start in this slide by taking a look at the direction of this acceleration. So we are talking about an object that moves in a circular path. Here's our circle. Okay, we'll let C represent the center of the circle. And we're gonna look at two times, okay, for this object. We'll look at the time where the object is at point A, and we can describe the position of the object at point A with this uh, position vector R sub A. Sometime later, okay, the object has moved to a different point. We will also describe the velocity of the object at point A with this vector V sub A. Notice that the vector is tangent to the circle, okay, at the point. Sometime later, the object has moved over to point B, and we can do the same thing. We can describe the position of the object at point B, okay, at that time with this position vector R sub B. If we want to look at the velocity of the object at point B, we can describe it with this vector. Notice here that the vectors V sub A and V sub B have the same magnitude. Okay, because the speed is the same by definition in uniform circular motion, but you'll notice that the direction, uh, the directions of these two vectors is not the same. Okay, as that object moves in a circle, its direction changes. So when, <clears throat> oh, and we will look at, okay, the, uh, these two position vectors being uh, separated by this angle theta. Now, when we look at the direction of the acceleration um, in uniform circular motion, and let's revisit our definition of acceleration here, we see that the direction of the acceleration will be in the direction of the change in velocity. So we need to figure out what does that vector delta V look like? So in order to do that, we're gonna to need to draw a vector diagram here. So we're gonna start by taking our vector V sub A, okay, uh, <clears throat> the velocity of our object at position A, okay, we will redraw, we will move this vector V sub B, showing the velocity of our object at position B, and this vector I'm drawing in right here represents the change in velocity as the object moves from A to B. Notice that when we look at this vector diagram here, using the tail to tip rule of vector addition, if we start with the vector V sub A, okay, we add in our change in velocity delta V, 
According to the tail to tip rule, we end up with a vector v sub b. I can write this same vector equation a little bit differently and say that delta v is simply the difference between okay, the velocity we end up at point b okay, mi minus the velocity we start out with at point a. We can do the same for our position vectors as well. Okay, we start out uh, at point A, described by this position vector R sub A. Uh, sometime later, our object is at point B, which we described with this position vector R sub B. And just like we did previously, we will say that this vector right here, delta R, represents our change in position, or more formally known as a displacement of our object, in moving from point A to point B. And we can write this vector equation similarly. Okay, our initial position, okay, R sub A plus our change in position or displacement delta R, we end up at our final position R sub B. Or we can say that delta R, change in position or displacement, is simply the difference of these two vectors, R sub B minus R sub A. Now, <clears throat> We see here when we look at our definition of acceleration that in the limit is delta t goes to zero. And this is going to take a little bit of imagination. As that time interval gets very, very small, think about what's happening to theta. Okay, theta is getting very, very small as well. Okay, and these vectors v sub a and v sub b are getting closer together. So I'm saying here that v sub a approaches v sub b as delta t and theta get very small. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm going to show you this, show you one other uh, vector diagram here. There's v sub a. Let's look at a very, very small time later, okay, where we let b get very close to a and let theta get small because our time is getting small. And I will draw uh, this picture here. Okay, so this represents a point B that is much, much closer to A. And you can start to see that when I draw in that vector delta V, you can start to see what's happening here. That vector delta V starts to become perpendicular to the vectors V sub A and V sub B. Okay, and um, in the limit, as our time interval gets infinitely small, Okay, as that angle theta becomes extremely small, we see that delta V uh, and uh, therefore A, remember the acceleration is in the same direction as delta V, point towards the center of the circle. Notice that if delta V is perpendicular to the velocity, then it must point towards the center of the circle. Since the velocity is always tangent to the circle, okay, the vector that is perpendicular to that will point towards the center of the circle. And because of this fact, we give this acceleration a name. We call it a centripetal acceleration, which literally means center-seeking. This is a center-seeking acceleration. So as that object moves at a constant speed in a circle, it experiences an acceleration that is directed towards the center of that circle. We call that a centripetal acceleration. So you'll notice here that I've included some information in the previous slide, which we will again need in this slide when we talk about calculating the magnitude of the centripetal acceleration. So, but before we go there, um, I want to propose this to you, okay? Why is it that the acceleration of an object that is exhibiting uniform circular motion, that is an object moving at a constant speed in a circle, uh, must be towards the center of that circle? Well, consider this. From what you know about vectors, if the acceleration was not perpendicular to the velocity at all points, then that would imply that there was a component of acceleration that would exist in the direction of the velocity. So let me say that again. If the acceleration was not perpendicular to the velocity, then there must exist a component of acceleration that would be in the direction of the velocity. What would that 
component of the acceleration do? Well, if it's in the direction of the velocity, it's going to cause the speed of the object to change in the direction the object's moving, right? That would violate our very definition of uniform circular motion. So because uh, this assumption leads to an inherent contradiction, this is another way to look at, or let's say prove, that the acceleration of an object moving at a constant speed in a circle must be perpendicular to the velocity at all points. It must point towards the center of that circle. So let's now turn our attention to uh, an expression for the magnitude of this acceleration, now that we know the direction of the acceleration. So we see here we have our, our definition of acceleration still on our slide here. And we're going to start by taking a look at two triangles here. Let me grab a laser pointer here. Uh, we're going to look at triangle ABC. Okay, um, and that is defined by these position vectors here. Notice I just put in the position vector delta R here. So triangle uh, ABC, defined by these three uh, position vectors. And let's um, take a look at this triangle V sub A, V sub B, delta V. These are similar triangles, and for similar triangles, you'll notice that the ratio of these two sides, that is delta V over V sub A, must be equivalent to okay, the ratio delta R over R sub A, because they're similar triangles. Now, um, I'm just going to say here that the magnitude of V sub A is equal to the magnitude of V sub B, that's just the speed of our object, which is always constant. So rather than talking about A's and B's, since the speed is always constant, let's just call it V. And let's do the same thing. If we look at the magnitude of the position vector R sub A and the magnitude of the position vector R sub B, um, it is simply the radius of our circle, which is itself constant. Let's just call that R. Let's just get rid of the A's and B's because they're unnecessary. The speed is constant and the radius is constant. So we'll use the symbols simply V and R. So given that uh, our equation for these similar triangles reduces to, we'll say delta V over V is equal to delta R over R. Now, we are going to divide both sides of this equation by delta T. Don't ask why right now. Let's just say because we can. And when we do that, okay, um, you notice that by definition, the magnitude of the acceleration is just delta V over delta T. Okay, that is the magnitude of that average acceleration, which according to our expression here for these similar triangles, if we solve this for delta V over delta T by multiplying both sides by V, isn't that simply equal to V times delta R, okay, divided by R times delta T? If we want to go from average acceleration to instantaneous acceleration, then we need to take the limit as we let delta t go to zero. So in the limit as delta t goes to zero of our average acceleration, okay, we will take the limit of this expression on the right-hand side here as delta t goes to zero. Notice that v and r are simply comments, constants they have nothing to do with that limit, so we will take it out here, in which case we have okay, V of R times the limit of this expression delta R over delta T as delta T goes to zero. Now, if you look at what ha is happening here with this triangle here, okay, in the limit as delta T goes to zero, and we saw this on the previous slide, theta goes to zero, theta gets extremely small, what happens here is that that vector delta r, okay, in the limit as delta t goes to zero, approaches the arc length here, okay, of this circle. You can imagine that for very, very small theta, this magnitude of the side of the triangle delta r will approach the arc length of the circle. In which case, when we take the limit of delta r over delta t as delta t goes to zero, isn't that simply the distance the 
object travels in that time divided by the time, that is simply the speed of the object over that very, very small time interval. So this uh, expression here, limit of delta R over delta T as delta T goes to zero, is nothing more than the speed of the object. So you can see here when we plug that in, okay, uh, um, when we plug that in, that uh, V over R times V gives us this expression V squared over R for the magnitude of our centripetal acceleration. And we will symbolize a centripetal acceleration. We'll call it A sub R because it is a it is a radial acceleration. It is it is uh, in the direction of uh, okay radially inwards. So very often we will use a subscript R to denote centripetal. Some texts actually use a C for centripetal. E either way, um, and we see here that it has a magnitude of V squared over R. So as we said in the previous slide, the magnitude of this centripetal acceleration is given by the expression V squared over R. That is the speed squared divided by the radius of the circle. In this slide, we will derive two other expressions for centripetal acceleration that are quite useful when it comes to problem solving. So the first expression we'll take a look at is expressed in terms of the period of revolution. Now, remember that the period, by definition, is the amount of time it takes to make one revolution, one complete circle. So for uniform motion, we know that the speed is constant, okay? And when this is the case, then the speed that an object uh, it has is simply the distance the object travels in a prescribed time. So given by you know, D over T. Now, here we're talking about an object that is moving in a circular path, so the distance it travels in making one complete circle is simply the circumference of that circle, two pi times the radius. And the time it takes to make one complete circle, that's what we call the period, okay, symbolized with a capital T. So if we take this expression for speed, and we simply plug it in to our expression for centripetal acceleration, that is V squared over R. We'll simply plug it in and simplify. And uh, when we cancel out common factors, we end up with the fact that the centripetal acceleration has this expression of four pi squared times the radius divided by the period squared. So if you were given a problem and in this problem, it gave you the period of the object rather than the speed, then this would be a formula to use, right? You wouldn't have to derive it every single time, although we did it here fairly simply. And one more expression we'll take a look at is related to the period. That's what we call the frequency of revolution, F. And there's a simple relationship between the frequency and the period. Uh, frequency, by definition, is the number of revolutions per unit time. Remember that the period is the time it takes to make one revolution. So we see here that the frequency and the period of revolution are simply reciprocals of each other. Okay, um, This can be confusing for students, but remember, if you remember simply that period is a measure of time and we'll have time units like seconds, minutes, hours, okay, that is really all you have to remember. And when we uh, take our expression for centripetal acceleration in terms of period, okay, we see that one over T squared is just F squared since period and uh, frequency are simply reciprocals of each other. So we get this other expression for centripetal acceleration, right? Four pi squared times the radius times the frequency squared. When it comes to measuring units for frequency, a common unit that you come across is that of hertz, okay, where a hertz is a one over second. So to summarize here, we have these three expressions to calculate the magnitude of the centripetal acceleration, okay, one in terms of the speed, one in terms of the period of revolution, one in terms of the frequency of revolution. So given a problem you're, you're confronted with, um, you know, start by asking yourself, am I given 
the speed in the problem, the period, or the frequency, and that will motivate which, which formula you end up using. In this slide, we'll take a look at solving a simple problem involving centripetal acceleration. So in this problem, we're told that we have a six meter diameter playground merry-go-round, moves at a constant speed uh, once the riders jump on. Calculate the centripetal acceleration that a rider on the edge of the merry-go-round would experience if it takes her 2.5 seconds to make one revolution. So as I was saying, whenever you're confronted with a problem and asked to calculate the centripetal acceleration, um, ask yourself, are you given information about the speed, the period of revolution, or the frequency of revolution? Here, from the context of the problem, it's pretty obvious that we're given information about the period when it tells us that it takes 2.5 seconds to make one complete revolution. That, by definition, is the period of revolution. So we will choose that formula to use and um, all we need to do is plug in our radius and period. I want to caution people to be very careful here. Anytime you talk about circular motion and as we will talk about later in the course when we talk about rotational motion in general, be careful to always distinguish between the diameter of a circle and a radius of a circle because some problems will give you the diameter, some will give you the radius, and you've always got to make sure you know which one you're using. In this problem, we're given the diameter of six meters, so to use this formula, that is not the number we want. Okay, That is not the measurement required. So we're going to have to divide that number by two to get the radius, and when we plug uh, into our, our formula here, plug in three meters for the radius and the 2.5 seconds for the period, and we do the number crunching, we come up with a value of about 19 meters per second squared for the centripetal acceleration. Now, obviously, the direction of this acceleration is always, okay, for this problem and all problems, going to be towards the center of the circle. So in the remainder of this presentation, we'll take a look at the general case of circular motion. So let's, let's see where we're going here. So where we've been, okay, we've talked about the special case of uniform circular motion where we say that the object moves at a constant speed in the circle. Now we'll be taking a look at the more general case where the object is still moving in a circle, but the speed is no longer constant. Okay, the speed can be changing in time. When it comes to the velocity vector, okay, we said that for the special case of uniform circular motion, the direction of the velocity changes, okay, whereas the magnitude does not. But in the general case, we will now say that both the magnitude and the direction of the velocity changes as the object moves in a circular path. So when we describe the acceleration when the velocity changes in both magnitude and direction, okay, one way to do this is to talk about two components to this acceleration. One component, that is the radial or centripetal acceleration, well, we already know about that one. Okay, that's what we call the centripetal acceleration. We use the symbol A sub R to describe that. We say that the centripetal acceleration is caused by the fact that the direction of the velocity changes in time, and this gives rise to an acceleration which is perpendicular to, to the direction of motion in all cases and points towards the center of the circle. And one of the expressions we came up with to describe the magnitude of this acceleration is V squared over R. When we talk about the general case where now the magnitude of the velocity can change, Okay, this gives rise to a component of acceleration we call a tangential acceleration. We'll symbolize with the symbol A sub T. And here we say that the cause of the tangential acceleration is not because the direction of the velocity changes. This is due strictly to the fact that the magnitude of the velocity, that is the speed, changes in time. Okay, and when we look at the direction of this acceleration, this is the same uh, this is the same acceleration. It, it, we call it a tangential acceleration. It's a linear acceleration 
that we, we already know about. Okay, so this in this case, the acceleration is either in the direction of motion or opposite the direction of motion. This is exactly the same acceleration we talked about. We talked about the kinematics of one dimensional motion. Okay, so here we're talking about an object that is accelerating, uh, it's speeding up in the direction it's moving, or it is slowing down. And this acceleration is what we have been dealing with all year. This is simply the time rate of change, okay, of the speed dv dt. In this slide, we are going to describe or introduce two unit vectors that will help us okay, describe the direction of these two components of acceleration that we have for the general case of circular motion. Now, one of these we already know, and that is the unit vector r hat. We've used that before. So r hat, by definition, by convention, is a unit vector, which means it has a magnitude of one unit and it points radially outwards, okay? So it is, just by convention, an outward pointing vector. This second unit vector we haven't talked about yet, okay, which will allow us uh, to describe, okay, the tangential component of this acceleration is what we call theta hat, and I'm showing you here in the picture. Um, theta hat, by convention, by definition, uh, is tangent to the circle. It is in the direction of increasing theta when we measure uh, in a counterclockwise direction from the positive x-axis. So you probably learned in your trigonometry class that when you talk about reference angles, they're always measured in with respect to the positive x-axis and we arbitrarily define the counterclockwise direction to be positive. So we'll, we'll use these two vectors here and see how they can be used to describe the direction of these two components of our combined or total acceleration for this general case where an object moves in a circle at a, a variable speed. So here we have the total acceleration A is simply the sum of the two components, the radial component and the tangential component. Looking at the direction here, we can write it with these unit vectors. Notice that uh, the triple acceleration is always radially inwards. That would be opposite the direction of r hat, since r hat by convention is divided to be radially outwards. So here we have the negative sign, okay? Um, and neg it's in, the centripetal acceleration is in the negative r hat direction. Um, and likewise, the tangential acceleration, it will be in either plus or minus the theta hat direction. If you have an object that is moving in a counterclockwise direction and is speeding up, then the acceleration would be in the positive theta hat direction. If you had an object moving in the counterclockwise direction and it was slowing down, for that object, its acceleration would be in the negative theta hat direction. So for the tangential acceleration, because we have both cases either speeding up or slowing down, and we could have an object moving in a counterclockwise direction or a clockwise direction, we've got to choose the sign, okay, that fits the problem. So from here, we will just plug in the, the magnitude of these components here, V squared over R for the centripetal component and dV dt, Okay, our expression for the tangential acceleration, okay, for that component. Um, and finally here, if we want to talk about the magnitude of the total acceleration, okay, we can talk about the magnitude as simply the sum of the squares, sorry, the square root of the sum of the squares of these two components. And in the next slide, we'll take a look at a specific problem and uh, get a more visual interpretation of what we mean by the magnitude of that acceleration. In this last slide, we'll take a look at applying the physics that we've just talked about for this general case of circular motion. We'll apply it in solving a specific example here. So in this example, we're told that an automobile whose speed is increasing at the rate of 0.5 meters per second squared it travels along a circular road of radius 20 meters in a clockwise direction. 
when the instantaneous speed of the automobile is four meters per second, okay, we are asked to find first the tangential acceleration component. So if we take a look at the diagram, let's draw in this tangential acceleration component. We're gonna draw it in like this. Now remember that the direction of the tangential acceleration, unlike the centripetal acceleration, uh, could be in one of two directions. In this problem here, we're told that the car is moving in a clockwise direction and that its speed is increasing in time. That tells us that the tangential acceleration, this linear acceleration, is in the same direction the car is moving. That tells us it's going to be in this clockwise direction here. So you've got to figure this out from the context of the problem. So here uh, we said that theta hat by definition is always in the counterclockwise direction. Since our tangential acceleration is in the clockwise direction, it must be in the minus theta hat direction. As far as the magnitude of that tangential acceleration, notice that in this problem, it is simply given to us. Okay, there's nothing to calculate. You could be given a problem where you would have to find that by maybe being given an equation of motion, which you would differentiate to find uh, the, the velocity, which you could then differentiate a second time to find the acceleration. That's one possibility. Or you'd be given two velocities over a small time interval, and you'd be asked to calculate the average acceleration from the definition of average acceleration. This particular problem, though, notice that we are given the magnitude of that tangential component. So we're next asked to find the radial acceleration component at this speed. I want to point out here that for the case of uniform circular motion, the centripetal acceleration always has one value because the speed is always constant. But for the general case of circular motion, the speed changes continuously, in which case the magnitude of that centripetal acceleration is going to change in time. So here, we are asked to find that centripetal or radial acceleration at one particular time. That is when the automobile has a speed of four meters per second. So um, I'm gonna draw in the radial or centripetal component of that acceleration. Unlike the tangential component, that centripetal component, the direction is always obvious. It is always towards the center of the circle. And if we wanna find the uh, value of that centripetal component here, we look at the, this problem here and of these three formulas we have in this problem, we're given the speed. So we will use the V squared over R formula and using our unit vector, it is, will always be in the minus R hat direction. We'll plug in the value for speed, okay, of four meters per second. The radius of our circular path is 20 meters. And when we do the number crunching, we get a magnitude of 0.8 meters per second squared. And finally here, we are going to be asked to find the magnitude and direction of the total acceleration. If we take a look at our diagram here, these two components here, these two vector components here, we can simply add them up to get the total accelerations, simply the vector sum of these two components. So let's do that, okay? And when we do that, we see here that this total acceleration here is given by this red vector that you see in your diagram. Um, from here, we can find the magnitude and direction of that total acceleration. The magnitude of that uh, acceleration is going to be given by the same way we would find the magnitude of any vector, um, any two, uh, sorry, any vector uh, given the components of that vector, simply the square root of the sum of the squares of the components. So here, the magnitude of that total acceleration is given by the square root of the sum of the squares of its two perpendicular components, the tangential and radial component. When we plug in our numbers and do the number crunching, we get a value of about 0.943 meters per second squared. And to find the direction, just like with any vector, we need to find some angle that that resultant vector makes with respect to some chosen axis. I'm showing you in the diagram here this angle theta. So we can find that angle by using a, a, the inverse tangent function here. And we take the inverse tangent of the radial component over the tangential component, and we get uh, a value of 58 degrees when we do the number crunching.